afternoon. We're gonna take our focus off of the point, which might be hard to do for a lot of the surf men and women here, but we're gonna look at the Pamlico Sound. Um, give you a little bit of background. I work for the North Carolina Coastal Federation. I have three regional offices, and we work out of an office in Wanchies and the industrial park up there. Um, the primary goal of the Coastal Federation is the preservation and improvement of coastal water quality in our habitats. We have a few other sub goals. So one thing I'm going to provide a little disclaimer is that we're not directly involved in fisheries management. Um, so we don't get involved in recreational or commercial fishing issues directly, but indirectly we kind of participate in supporting that population through the preservation of our coastal water quality and habitats. Um, but for today we're going to be talking about ecology. Oop, there's a little spelling error here, maybe it looks a little funny. But the word ecology is derived from the Greek word uh, oikos, pertaining to family or family's property or the house. And when we add a suffix to it of logi or ology, we get the study of the house. So that's kind of the framework of this presentation. We're talking about the study of the house. Here's a little illustration of a diagram. And um, when we drop the E and just look at ecology, we start thinking about the branch of biology that deals with the relationships between organisms. So these diagrams typically show how um, organisms and organic material at the lower trophic levels, the plant mass and detritus is flowing into our water bodies. Some of the other smaller organisms, worms and shrimp and crabs are uptaking um, this energy here and it's being exported into larger organisms and eventually they make their way out into the ocean, which is where we start targeting some of the species that are most desirable, like red drum, and trout and bluefish. But one thing I find interesting when you look at these diagrams is they usually leave out kind of a top predator here. Our, us and the, the relationship we have here is a favorable relationship for the surf fishermen here but an unfavorable one for the red drum but we're going to be thinking a, bit, a little bit about before we got out to the point out to this large red drum that we're targeting here i know everything that's behind us and to the west here in the pamlico sound so we're going to step away from the point and i mean this is just one of the most dynamic places i've ever had the pr privilege of exploring around and we're going to look into the Pamlico Sound, which is just as dynamic. And we see these changes year after year. This is our second largest estuary in the country, just after the Chesapeake Bay to the north here. And we're going to take a look at it as a, a system, as a comprehensive system. So not just the water body, but we're looking at, see, some of this boundary over here is extending over the land. And we're going to be looking at kind of the gradient of how the hydrology is draining from the land mass into the sound and eventually exiting out through our inlets here. And to make it a little more manageable, I mean, this is a, a pretty large blob here. We're gonna break it down into some smaller subsections that are a little, a little easier to digest. And estuaries are a gradient of where our freshwater and saltwater are, are mixing here. So we can look at the smaller tributaries, the areas in red here, uh, which is draining the land mass after precipitation events and draining into our river systems that are highlighted in yellow there. And finally, all of that um, is mixing in the back barrier sound, the area in green, and it's kind of what we're going to be focused on mostly for, the, for this talk here. And, and before I said the Federation isn't really involved in fisheries management, but we do try to protect some of our coastal habitats. Uh, these areas that are highlighted in green here are nursery areas. What are nurseries good for? Who's in nurseries? Babies. And see, so these are really important habitats. These are central fish habitats here. These are nursery areas. And if we like surf fishing for the, some of those target species here, these areas of habitat are just as critical that we protect and ensure uh, that they're able to provide substantial food for those that we are targeting as well. And within uh, these nursery areas, I pulled some data from Vision of Marine Fisheries to kind of look at who's using it and who's eating whom. Uh, before we work up the food web here. So we'll start with shrimp. Uh, brown shrimp is the most abundant shrimp species in North Carolina here, accounting for 67% of the commercial landings. Uh, this little guy is feeding on organic material, worms, other organic matter is decaying. And what we'll notice is that even though they're congregated here in this sample, this is a trawl sample that's done on a semi-annual basis to kind of get an understanding of uh, different fish species that are utilizing these areas and what they're consuming, uh, you'll see those areas, the larger black dots, congregating higher abundances of population here. So they're hugging around those nursery areas that, that we highlighted before. 
Next is the white shrimp. This one's accounting for the second most uh, landings, about 28%. Uh, these guys are in the range like eight to one, it goes up to about 11 inches here, so kind of on the smaller side, but the last piece of information I have here pertains to their life cycle, and we'll see that even though the shrimp are congregating in the sounds, they're actually uh, spawning in the ocean, and then that larvae is working its way back into the estuary, so kind of that connection between the sound and the ocean through the inlets here. The last shrimp that uh, you might harvest are spotted pink shrimp or spotted shrimp here, and we'll see it's only accounting for about 5% of the population um, that's been identified in commercial landings here. Working up our food chain is the most important species from a commercial standpoint, is our blue crab here. Uh, it's the most valuable commercial fishery in our state. And this one has a really interesting life cycle because you know, it's been sampled in the sound or most of the crabbing happens in the sound. They actually work their way up to the rivers into more freshwater brackish systems to mate. And then they'll go back out towards the inlets to spawn. And then that larvae will work its way back into the estuaries and go through various uh, metamorphosis and larval stages before we get to the one we typically see today. Finally, getting into some of the thin fish here, we have spot, uh, you know, smaller in stature, about seven to 10 inches here, but really important to the fishery just because of its sheer abundance here. Uh, we were looking at some of the numbers at the bottom. Uh, you know, they were in the, the couple hundred range. This one on one of the trawl surveys, we're seeing that they're collecting about 3,700 to 5,000 in one trawl at some of these sampling locations. So really important uh, from a larger ecological standpoint because many of the other larger fin fish species are feeding on these spot. Also have some spot festivals, so we want to make sure there are a lot out there so we can keep those festivals running. <coughs> Another fish, uh, kind of in the same, same ballpark here as far as the family, but is the Atlanta croaker, and you'll find them in greater abundances a little further away from the brackish water and some of the areas that are a little more saline. Uh, most of these fish species, spot, croaker, are feeding on shrimp, small crabs, other smaller fish, and worms. And they also spawn in the ocean, and then that larvae will work its way back into the sound. And they'll spend most of their, their lives uh, in the seagrass beds, throughout the sound and estuaries. Moving kind of up in the food web here, a little more of a predatory fish is our southern kingfish. But also mostly working on the bottom there, feeding along our worms and crabs and shellfish from time to time. And our bluefish. Now we're starting to get into the ones that we might target. Um, a lot of people like catch whiting or sea malt as well, but bluefish a little more favorably. And this one was interesting when we started to look at the sampling results. Uh, you know, they're only getting about 10 to 15 in one of these samples. And I chatted with the gentleman from the Division of Marine Fisheries as I was looking through this slide, and I said, why have all of a sudden this big drop? Um, they said, this fish may actually be evading uh, the trawl. So kind of a discussion on the sampling methodology that's being used, and it's not that the population's low, it's that some of these other species are bottom feeders and they're really susceptible to being caught in the trawl, whereas the bluefish may not be. And please correct me if I misstated anything. Well, the weak fish is gonna be the last fin fish we talk about. We're kind of going back into the hydrology after this and some of the vegetation in the area. Uh, really popular fish for targeting. Here, the average length of 12 to 16, getting up to that three foot, if you really got the big one that day. Um, starting to feed on um, fish in the upper trophic level here, so small fish and medium-sized fish. But again, these guys actually have a different life cycle where they would spawn in the estuary and then overwinter out in the ocean. There's a lot. We could go through all the profiles of all the fish in here, but we had 15 minutes today, so we just tried to give a sample on who's in the estuary. Uh, I'm sure you're familiar with a lot of the fish depicted on this picture here. And you could probably go on and on and on. But that's where we're going to end the kind of the ecological standpoint of just some of the organisms uh, that are in, in the sound. And we're going to talk about more of the house, the structure. So what's the water quality like around the Pamlico Sound? Well, we are so fortunate to be surrounded by area that's been protected and preserved. Uh, there's limited amounts of development from both the the seashore and our wildlife refuges around here in this area highlighted in yellow are identified by the North Carolina Division of Water Resources as high quality water. So they su can support high biological activity, uh, chemical and physical and biological characteristics are, are really outstanding waters. Uh, other areas that are classified as an even higher classification are in the Alligator River Wildlife Refuge in Delano Port Smith Island where you see there's you know, virtually no development in that area. Our second classification uh, is classified as SB, or saltwater 
that supports primary recreation, so any type of recreation where swimming is the, the primary activity that's occurring, so along the entire ocean front, but then in some of our um, upper river bodies as well. And then the next is our SC waters. These support secondary recreation, such as fishing or boating. What I like most about this depiction is you really start to see the veins and the arteries that are running through the landscape and connecting the landscape to the sound. All that water is draining off the landscape eventually out into the sound. We can go a little further. It's kind of hard to see right now, but our, our fourth classification are swamp water, so we're going further inland. So all that water, that hydrologic connection is draining off of the land out into the sound and eventually making its way through the inlets. The Division of Water Resources has identified some areas in lime green, if you can see that to the left side, um, around the Tar Pamlico and Noose River that are sensitive to nutrient loading. So if we have nitrogen phosphorus coming off the landscape, that could produce algal blooms over time, eventually lead to fish kills from time to time. So the Division of Water Resources has developed um, some water quality management plans to help reduce some of that higher nutrient loading that's coming into the sound. But for the most part, I mean, it's pretty pristine water that's out there. Because we have sponges, natural sponges or wetlands, and if you look at this, this illustration here, you can see most of the landscape is actually classified as wetland type properties. It's either wetlands or maritime forests for the most part. If we look at just the southern end of Hatteras Island or Okokoke Island, we can see most of it is either salt marsh or maritime forest. And some of the plants you might encounter that act as natural filters or sponges when this water is running off the landscape before it reaches into the sound or glasswood or pickleweed, maybe you put it in a salad and gave it a little extra salty taste or crunch to it. Uh, some of the most common species you'll see along kind of the edge of the, the marshland is our smooth cord grass. You can see it's in bloom here in fall, it's going to seed. If we move up the gradient a little bit and to slightly higher topography, and the one thing that's kind of unique about uh, the sound side estuary is small changes in gradients of elevation uh, result in plant species that actually just have really evolved over time to proliferate in these areas. So black needle rush is in a little higher elevation than our smooth cord grass. So you see a lot of zonation and differences. Going up a little higher on onto the beach here is our salt meadow cord grass. Two other species you might see commonly are salt grass or spike grass and sea lavender on some of the higher elevations or more sandy elevations where they're not inundated quite as frequently. But we do have some plants that can tolerate being inundated constantly. We call them submerged aquatic vegetation. We have uh, the backside of our barrier islands here have either patchy or continuous beds of submerged aquatic vegetation where our juvenile and other estuarine species reside. We have three types here, we have eelgrass, shoalgrass, and widgeon grass. And let's see if we can get this running. Just the illustration of some of the detritus flowing around in there and some small little minnows. We haven't really talked about any of the bait fish today, but who are utilizing this habitat. And it's really important these uh, vegetation grows in this kind of more shallow area where light can penetrate to the bottom. So we don't really want areas that are really turbid or a lot of sediment suspended in the material because then the light will not be able to penetrate to the bottom and they can't photosynthesize. So that's one of the reasons to really try to support wetland restoration is so we can remove some of that sediment that would be flowing off of the landscape, allowing the submerged aquatic vegetation to grow. A couple of areas highlighted in red, and if you look on the um, legend, see the areas in red are listed as a bulkhead. And so now we've kind of been talking a lot about the ecology of the Pamlico Sound and what an outstanding resource it is. Now we're just going to take one or two minutes to talk about how bulkheads have removed the ability of wetlands to filter uh, that water that's going out into the sound. So these are where bulkheads have been constructed. And then we look back to the Division of Water Resources and we see some areas in red uh, where we may see higher levels of bacteria or nutrients because we no longer have that filtration ability. But this is true even in natural landscapes, not just developed landscapes. You can see some areas that are a little more sensitive, have a higher um, bacteria counts, or fecal coliform, just naturally draining from the landscape. So one thing that the Coastal Federation has tried to do on the restoration side is to restore and place those, those filters and sponges back along the landscape. So this is an example down in uh, near Hatteras Harbor of an area that was devoid of vegetation, it was a high energy system. Um, some of it was eroding over time, so they put in an offshore sill to kind of dissipate some of the wave energy, and then went back and did marsh grass plantings. Uh, so here we are in the timeline, 
and kind of see how long it takes to restore this habitat. And the one thing is that the restored habitat will never provide the same benefits that were there in the first place. So even though we can try as, as we might, preserving it is kind of the first means that we try to keep the ecological system services that we have that are already provided for us. So in June 2011, go into September, we've had one growing season. You can see the marsh grass starting to get established. One more growing season, getting established a little bit more, but it's really patchy. And finally, it took almost two growing seasons just to get a single line of um, marsh grass here. That was our, our smooth cord grass here. So we've taken two years just to get back uh, some of the same areas that have been well established. So preservation is kind of preferred. We can go to re restoration afterwards. One of the things we were also experimenting with the kind of living shoreline component compared to a bulkhead construction uh, is placing loose oyster shell out in front to dissipate some of that wave energy over time. So now we have kind of two stages of, of habitat here and defense because the waves are dissipated by the oysters, which provide habitat for small juvenile species and crabs. And then that wave energy is further dissipated as it interacts with all the little uh, blades of grass, marsh grass over time. And just a quick video of who, who's home, who's utilizing some of this oyster habitat. See some pinfish here swimming around, grazing off of the, uh, the restored oyster bags here. So I've, I've done some of the oyster restoration along the living shoreline areas, but we also do it as a sanctuary site. There's the center Gene Preston in the middle of the Pamlico Sound. Here, they just completed their third phase of restoration as a large sanctuary site where you can't harvest oysters, but you can hook and line fish from these uh, sanctuary sites, and then there's also all these patch reefs that are being constructed in partnership with the Division of Marine uh, Fisheries uh, throughout here, kind of restoring some of that habitat, restoring the capabilities of the oysters to filter our water naturally and get through about 50 gallons a day.